the short version of what I think I have observed in this matter is that you can compare it with a scientist standing on the top of a mountain which is covered with snow and the climate of the snow is very important because if you want to make a cascade or something, a snowball, sometimes you try and try to get the public interested. There's no, uh, uh, there's no response to if you make a snowball, you make it. Nothing happens. But sometimes a lot happens. And you, you stand on the top as a scientist and you snow a snowball and then it starts rolling down all the time and it becomes bigger and bigger and suddenly it seems to to compromise the whole world. And I think it could be similar to the situation we have experienced in the later years with with the discussions about climate. On top of the mountain they stand in the proper scientists, and they try to call the, call the snowball back, but they, but they can't. It's just rolling. You must live with it. You must try to do your science as good as you can. Do we see something? But I think there are two major discre discrepancies about in, in climate sciences. Our disrupted understanding of what is real, the scientist, in social contexts. That is a very important thing that we must understand. We are not living in, a, in, a, in an ideal world. We are also social individuals. And, and that's where the problems come in. And we have also our disrupted use of models, forecasting, control, control, reconstruction. That's in my world very important because geologists, as geologists, we are always, all the time, reconstructing what is going on in, in the world. And we do do it by methods which you cannot do in, in the law <coughs> the sciences. And that will create some, some problems. If you have a look on the first year uh, disruption, I think it's important to, to, to just to discuss what science is dealing with, or what you think it is dealing with. The classic def definition is that reality is, as, as, as we, we think we deal with reality. And reality is, in the classic definition, is what exists independently of what I think it is, and what I think about it. Uh, in around 1900, the American philosopher Charles uh, Peirce, who was a geophysicist and, uh, and became, I, I think, the most uh, important American uh, philosopher ever, uh, he tried to, to make another more modern definition so that the humanities and social sciences, psychology and so on, could be included not only the king of science, physics, but all the other sciences could be included in what, in what, in the definition of what reality is, and his de definition is that reality is what exists in the mind of a group, independently of what the individual group members think about it. And the, the conclusion of this is very important because the, it means that science is also a social activity. Don't forget it. So, and the, the, we have the second disruption, which, which may more uh, create uh, more uh, conflicts internally in science. That is the conflict between law sciences, as mostly executed by mathematicians, physicists, chem chemists, and so on, uh, and which are fundamentally categoric prognostic sciences, which are working under quantitative so-called laws, but they are working only under the constant <coughs> foreseeable external uh, conditions. If they were to be applied on a radically changing world, uh, they wouldn't say anything of, of value. And, and of course, you <coughs> know it is like that. Then we have the evolutionary sciences, such as the earth sciences, biology, astronomy and so on, where the world of the universe or the object of observation is changing all the time in a stochastic way. We cannot really uh, 
make prognosis, but where your window of observation is the past. <laughs> that one is working on the pre uh, on the past and on the on the coming time. But these sciences, the earth sciences in broad sense, are working on the past. And they are uh, they are fundamentally pragmatic narrative sciences, which are also not only working with laws but also with causal explanation and interactions between the observed system and the disruptive changes of the external conditions. So, it's, in a broad speaking, it's history, and you cannot always quantify what is going on in your explanations and so on. If we try to put this up in a very short uh, system of the, of the development of, of uh, modern uh, philosophy, we must start with the logic uh, positivism, the so-called Vienna <coughs> School, which evolved in the late 1800s, which were made basically only designed for physics as such uh, ways of think thinking. And uh, it, it, it's basically a, a law uh, uh, philosophy, the positivism. It doesn't really work in our... Um, <coughs> disciplines of science. Then we have Karl Popper, who was a member of the Wiener School, but became the big changer of it. He, he started his, uh, his philosophy of science because he saw that it was uh, running the world in a wrong direction. He became one of the big critics, critics of uh, Stalin and of Hitler, he had to, he had to flee to New Zealand in order to survive. And after the war, he came back back to London and we became prof professor there. But his philosophy is is a part, though, is 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 around the positivism, but is changed to nearly the opposite. That you must only you can only have uh, refute. So, uh, hypothesis if, uh, if the science is going to be uh, fruitful. If you cannot say what will undermine or strengthen your theory, it's not fruit fruitful. And, and that's the opposite of thinking that you can prove anything. He thinks you cannot prove anything, you can disprove something. And that, of course that changes the uh, the the way one should think about the philosophy or, or uh, proofs, proofs. Then you have Thomas Kuhn, who in the 50s, 60s, 70s made a large study of, of especially physics and saw that uh, uh, physics or science in the broad sense had been all the time developing in a uh, paradigmatic sense, sense, which is that you, you come from an original observation or theory and which is adopted by almost everybody. It's the so-called mainstreaming. And what happens then? Then you have this paradigm which is going on all the time. And, and it, it, it evolves into a system where it doesn't accept criticism. <coughs> We have seen it many times in history of science, especially in, in England, when um, Kevin was the head of the, the of the Royal Society, where he refuted Darwinism and almost everything that happened outside physics. Um, yeah. Then, uh, in the line of Kuhn, there's a very important Hungarian philosopher, Lakatos. Who, who has described how paradigms evolve in themselves after having been mainstreamed. The paradigm protects itself with a lot of mainstream research, which lies as a protective shell around it and makes it almost impossible to criticize anything which is part of the paradigm. 
until something very important happens and everybody can see there was something wrong. Well, and what I think is coming up now is the understanding of social impact on science. I would like to mention my colleague in Copenhagen, Vincent Hendricks, who makes very large studies of barber cascade and echo room studies. Not just in, in science, but uh, in, in the ordinary way of reasoning. How almost everything, when you doubt about anything, can develop in a, in a very large bubble or a cascade, many bubbles, or uh, echo room simply because you are, because of the social the social impact you are a part of. You cannot really. <coughs> most people is like to stick out and not be a member of a power. I don't think you do, but I have heard about it at least. I think he's an upcoming guy who, who has got the long end. No, you took my time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Then I would like to to, to say that uh, or usually we think we we, we, we think in, in the inductive or the deductive way that we can only distinct between always or never or between true and false. But the abductive way of thinking, which was founded by Charles Percy 100 years ago, it is a new one, and and it is what we call. Um, the, the common sense way of thinking, the way scientists do and the way ordinary people do, if they do it right. And that would be, 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 be put up in a system like that, where, which is, where it, is, it is some common words that is <coughs> defining what we're doing. To be, to sense, to wonder, then you go into the analytical abduction phase where you ask, what is this? You guess it might be, and then you try. That's the scientific way of it. And then you go into the conclusive phase where you judge what is true and what is false, and you have to declare what you believe, and you have to socialize, to agree on what a group should do. And the whole process is iterative. And that means that you come under social pressure many times before you come to to to. to to uh, to uh, to, uh, to to a certain opinion. Yes, we go forth. <laughs> well, then it's very important to think about the. I don't talk about the psychology of understanding, but um, what the window, the window of observation, which is very important. Most people work in here, what I call the domain of face. I'll take the next uh, slide to show it. That's where you can do your law physics. That's where you have direct measurements. You can put numbers of everything. But you have also the narrative part of the world, which we could call extra domain, where you can use the ordinary common sense. You can. You can interpret traces. If you, for instance, come into a room, you can, there's a piece of crushed paper on the table, you can deduct a lot of things, but you cannot put numbers on it. You can say there was a table, somebody went into a room, they crushed a piece of paper and laid it on the table. You stretch the paper out, you can see, you can. You can uh, say with certainty that the paper existed before it, there was printed something on it, and, and, and before that, well, after that, somebody wrote with a red pencil out. You can reconstruct the world, and that's what you do all the time. But that part of science does not really fit into what, what people think. And then there is Kant, Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher who said, you must distinguish between das Ding and sich, things that they are in real, and things that are das Ding, if you want, what we, uh, what we uh, 
as, as things that we've seen. And before we understand that these observations windows are incomplete, first of all, and that there are two major observation fields in, in science, we will have a problem internally in science. So, so what can you do about it? I haven't got the time to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I just say stand up for the fruitful science. Yes. Karl Popper's ideas on what science is, and of course for the freedom of, of science when you give advice to governments and so on. <laughs> That's it.